Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. So today we're going over some SAT predictions for the upcoming digital SAT. And the first prediction here is going to be for the SAT English section. We're going to be talking about multivariable evidence questions. All right, so that sounds kind of scary, but it's pretty simple uh, when put into practice. So essentially what you're going to get is a long paragraph, right? And then the question is going to ask you to... Uh, evaluate the hypothesis and then find supporting evidence uh, based on that in the answer choices. So what you're going to find is that there's going to be multivariable. So what does this multivariable mean? Well, essentially what's going to happen is you're going to get a distractor variable within the actual text itself that appears in your answer choices. So we'll go through this problem and you'll see what I mean. So we have linguist uh, Deborah Tannen has cautioned against framing contentious issues in terms of two highly competitive perspectives such as pro versus con. According to Tan, this debate-driven approach can strip issues of their complexity and when used in front of an audience can be less informative than the presentation of multiple pers perspectives in a non-competitive format. To test Tannen's hypothesis, students conducted a study in which they showed participants one of three different versions of local news commentary about the same issue. So first off, I just want to point something out is that instead of the typical two uh, perspectives that you would expect because you have here you're framing it as two highly competitive perspectives right which is this debate driven approach and then the other side here is the multiple perspectives in a non-competitive format however with the rest of the text here you can see deciphers another version right so they conducted this study where they showed one participant three different versions there's three different versions when we were only introduced to two. So, hmm, what could the third version be? Well, let's keep reading. Uh, the local news commentary about the same issue. Each version featured a debate between two commentators with opposing views, a panel of three commentators with various views, or a single commentator. So I'm going to say this right now, guys. This debate between two commentators, that is the highly competitive perspective. That a panel of three commentators with various views just because they have various views does not mean they're debating. That is tapping right into the multiple perspectives part in a non-competitive format, right? Because we're literally getting a panel instead of a debate. But now the distractor here is a single commentator. So we have to look out for that in our answer choices. So A says, on average, participants perceive the commentators in the debate as more knowledgeable about the issue than commentators in the panel. So that directly does not even speak to the actual argument made because this is getting a little messy. So let me just erase some things here. It says, according to Tannen, the debate-driven approach can strip issues of their complexity and can be less informative to the audience. So not only does A not even talk about it being informable to the audience, it's just saying that the audience perceives the people in the debate to be more knowledgeable. That doesn't mean they've gained any new information, right? Um, and so it can't be A. B says on average participants perceived commentators in the panel as more knowledgeable about the issue than the single commentator. So this is weird now because you're comparing the panel, the multiple perspectives to the single commentator. But the single commentator is not what the original claim was being made against, right? So the original claim was against the debate driven approach, not the single commentator. So a single commentator can't be deba debating themselves, right? So it cannot be B. C says, on average, participants who watched the panel correctly uh, answered more questions than the issue about the issue than those who watched the debate or the single commentator did. Well, here, let's see what we have. We have people who watched the panel, right? So the panel is the multi-perspective uh, approach, answered more questions about the issue correctly than those who watched either the, the debate or the single commentator. So therefore, we already have supporting evidence here because first off, it's supporting the side with the panel of multiple perspectives, but it's also knacking against the debate side, right? Because we want evidence that the debate strips issues of their complexity and also is less informative for the audience. And so if people are answering questions more correctly on the panels as compared to the debate, then that is strong evidence and therefore answer is C. All right, so our next prediction is going to be for the math section. That has to deal with inscribed shapes and area. I have a simple example here just so we can get through it a little faster. But essentially, let's break the problem down. So we have a inscribed uh, rectangle inside of a circle, right? So on your SAT, you might see something similar to this 
where you have inscribed shapes. Maybe it can be a triangle or maybe something more complex, right? Like a trapezoid or something. And so what they're really trying to test is, do you know the formulas which are given to you? And so you have to utilize those formulas um, as well as other potential features like Pythagorean theorem or maybe even special right triangles to ultimately find the area of either one of those shapes or a part of those shapes. So it says in the figure above, rectangle ABC is inscribed in the circle with center O with the area of the circle. We give us side lengths 24 and 10, and therefore we need to find the area of the circle. So to find the area of a circle, that is pi r squared equals the area of a circle. So what we need to do is find the radius, but how can we find the radius? Well, we need to utilize this rectangle, right? You can see here, if we draw a diagonal from point D across O, the center, to B, we create a right triangle in this rectangle. But this uh, side length of DB is also the diameter. So we, if we find that, we can take half of that, which is the radius, square it, and ultimately find the area of the circle. So let's go with 24 squared. We're just using Pythagorean theorem now, plus 10 squared equals C squared. That's going to be... 576 plus 100 equals c squared. So that's going to be square root 676 equals c. And so c is going to give us the answer 26. And so we know db right now is 26, right? But we're not going to be utilizing 26, the value of 26, because that is the diameter and not the radius. So take half of that, and that will give us our radius. So our radius here is 13. And so now we have the formula for the area of a circle, which is just pi r squared. So if we know that the radius is 13, we just do 13 squared times pi. So 13 squared here gives us 169 pi. And we can see here that this simplified version ends up with choice D, and that is our final answer. And so for our next set of SAT predictions for the English section, it's gonna be these quote unquote bait note questions. So these are rhetorical synthesis questions or the student note card questions, however you like to call them, um, where essentially now you actually have to read the notes, right? Instead of just skipping down to the question and then just uh, picking the answer that best describes the claim. But the strategy I like to use here is just go through with your normal strategy. And what you're going to find is usually you're going to be ending up with two questions or two answer choices that uh, both establish a relevant claim to the question but one of them is going to be either factually or infactually uh, correct. So let's get right into this example and we'll see what we're talking about. So it says the student wants to indicate the California red leg frogs WS classification category, which choice most effectively uses relevant information from the notes to accomplish this goal. All right, so we want to indicate the specific w FWS classification category. All right, A says species on the W. FWS list, that's hard to say, I'm just gonna skip it from now on, which includes the California red lake frog are classified as either endangered or threatened. All right, so this is a problem and it's not A because it says it's classified as either endangered or threatened. We want a specific classification, which A does not give us. B says the California red legged frog appears on the FWS list of at-risk species. That could be a potential classification until you read the first bullet which says the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Service keeps a list of all at-risk species. So everything in here is a list of at-risk spe species. So it's on a specific classification, and therefore it cannot be B. C says, according to the thing, the California red-legged frog is in the endangered category, uh, in danger of extinction throughout most or all of its range. So here... Could be a potential answer, right? Because it is making the claim that it's in the endangered category. D says, likely to soon become endangered, the California red light frog is classified as threatened. All right, so this says it's classified as threatened, while this one says it is already in the endangered category. D also says it's likely soon to be in the endangered category. So we can make a comparison between these two claims. Is it endangered or is it likely to soon be endangered? Well, Let's read up here. It says species on the list are classified as either endangered or threatened. Yeah, we know that. Species that are in danger of extinction throughout most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A species that is likely to soon become endangered is classified as threatened. Okay, interesting. That could be relevant for D. And this last part says the 
uh, California red leg frog is likely to soon become endangered. All right. So that means that it cannot be answer choice C because it is likely to soon become endangered, which is directly stated in D. So D is our answer for that. All right, everyone. So we're going to wrap up the video today with a trig relations math prediction. So here is the question. It's a very interesting one. So what you need to know here is that sine and cosine aren't complements of each other, right? So when you have something like sine x degrees, that's going to be equivalent to cosine 9 degrees minus x, right? And now, so the easiest way to solve a problem like this is to just memorize this right? and just understand the complements, right? But if you don't, here's a neat way you can do it, right? So if sine of x degrees equals a, which of the following must be true for all values of x? What we can do here is create a special right triangle, right? So we have a triangle here that's 90 degrees here. And sine of x, we can just call it anything, but let's make it a special right triangle. So let's call that 30 degrees. So we know this is going to be a 60 degree angle. Right? And then this is x. Let's just label x there. And so what we now have is a special right triangle where we actually can determine the side lengths, right? So side lengths here is opposite of 30 degrees and be x. Opposite of 60 degrees will be x square root 3. And then it's going to be the hypotenuse of 2x. So let's just plug in 1 for x. And so we just get 2 square root 3 and 1. Now we can just determine what sine of x actually is, right? So sine of x here is sine 30 degrees. Sine of 30 degrees, we know sine is opposite over hypotenuse, so opposite is 1, hypotenuse is 2. So we're looking for 1 half. So let's just go through the answer choices. Cosine x, cosine of uh, 30. So cosine of 30 cannot be equivalent to sine of 30 because sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Well, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, right? So it can't be A. Now, B is sine 90 minus x. So we know x here is 30 degrees. And so sine of x. So what is sine of x so 9 minus 30 is 60 so sine of 60 degrees now we're looking at this top part so that's opposite over hypotenuse so is one half equal to square root 3 over 2 nope now let's look at cosine 90 minus x so 90 we know x is 30 so 90 minus 30 is 60 so we're looking at cosine 60 degrees now so cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse so now we're looking at this up here so adjacent here is going to be 1 and the hypotenuse is 2 and therefore, we can see cosine 60 is equal to 1 half, and that is our answer.